On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this web conference titled Health Literacy Webinar Series, Webinar Number 3, Informed Consent. My name is Jeff Bomboy, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the webinar. Kathy Reynolds is Patient Safety Liaison with the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority for the Southeast Region of Pennsylvania. Kathy is an accomplished healthcare and patient safety professional specializing in the analysis of adverse events and facility-wide implementation of patient safety plans. With over 17 years of experience in healthcare, Kathy has served as a registered nurse and quality improvement coordinator in Philadelphia area hospitals and most recently as patient safety managers for the Einstein Healthcare Network. Our second speaker is Fran Miranda, and she is the Director of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Quality Assurance and Performance Improvement at Lehigh Valley Health Network. Her involvement in clinical risk management, quality, performance improvement, as well as patient safety activities through the health network expands more than 28 years. Kathy, now I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon uh, to everybody that's joining us today. I just want to take a moment before we get started to make a note that this webinar is intended to discuss health literacy within the context of informed consent. We're not going to be focusing on legal and regulatory guidelines for informed consent. I would recommend that would really be most appropriate for you to consult with your internal counsel, internal legal counsel for that legal advice. So I just wanted to make a note of that in case anybody was expecting different. So we're here to discuss health literacy. Uh, principles in the context of informed consent and using these principles to optimize your informed consent processes. Uh, so I've been thinking a little bit about this, about health literacy, and it takes me back to what I saw regularly when I was a nurse in the ER, a night shift nurse in the ER in Center City, Philadelphia. Uh, I, you know, in the triage role, I'd often see patients come in um, and, you know, it explained that they didn't take their water pill for a few days um, because, well, as you know, it makes you go to the bathroom a lot and they had something to do and they didn't want to be inconvenienced, but not really connecting it to um, their heart condition or to misunderstanding instructions for how to care for a wound. But when you're that close of it, you don't really get to see and understand the full scope of the issue. So I think we'll talk a little bit about that today and then some applications, um, you know, at the facility level. So our objectives, again, are to define health literacy. We'll describe the scope and implications of the health literacy problem in the U.S. and PA. We'll identify barriers by, um, faced by both patients and clinicians in addressing low health literacy and provide some strategies to enhance health literacy, again, within the context of informed consent. So what is health literacy? At a basic level, health literacy is the ability to read, understand, and act on health information effectively. Taking that a bit further, functional health literacy is the ability to, uh, to apply reading skills and to apply numeracy, numeracy skills in the healthcare setting. Numeracy is defined as the ability to reason and to apply simple numerical concepts. Basic numeracy skills consist of comprehending fundamental mathematics like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. For example, if you can imagine, if one can understand simple mathematical equations such as 2 plus 2 equals 4, then one would be considered possessing at least basic numeric knowledge. This can be important when dosing medication. If you have instructions to take four milligrams of a medication and have two milligram pills in the bottle. Uh, you can also imagine this to be important when calculating special diets, such as diabetic diets, low sodium, et cetera. A person can have completed the required number of years in school and still have limited health literacy. In fact, approximately 45% of high school graduates have limited health literacy. Health literacy requires knowledge from many topic areas, including knowledge of how the body works, healthy behaviors, and the workings of the health system. Health literacy is influenced by, lang by the language we speak, our ability to communicate clearly and listen carefully, by our age, socioeconomic status, cultural background, past experiences, cognitive abilities, and mental health. Each of these factors affect how we communicate, understand, and respond to health information. For example, it can be difficult for anyone, no matter the literacy skills, to remember instructions or read a medication label when feeling sick or when we have a coming procedure on our mind. Health information comes from many different sources and is delivered through multiple channels. And so it's really incumbent upon us as healthcare professionals to look at how we do our work, how we communicate verbally in written materials and other forms of interaction to ensure that our patients have the best opportunity to be the active participant participant in their care that we want them to be. 
We must keep in mind that you cannot tell someone's literacy level by just looking at them. A person may present themselves well, speak well, appear to understand what's going on. However, this, this does not mean that they, tr that they truly do. In terms of health literacy, having a universal approach means to assume that a patient has a low level of health literacy and to err on the side of caution in making clear communications and plain language standard, uh, the standard practice in all patient encounters. It is best to approach care with the understanding that even those who are well-educated may still struggle with health-related information. The language used in health field, jargon, again, you know, sticking away, getting away from jargon, is not commonly used in everyday language. And even those with a good education background may not understand what their diagnosis means or what is being asked of them. Even someone who normally manages health information well may have increased difficulty under certain circumstances. When a person's feeling anxious or overwhelmed with too much information, they may not be able to understand or use health information as normal. I can personally relate to this as I found myself, even as an ER nurse, um, I was having an allergic reaction several years ago to an antibiotic and it was sort of a new experience for me and it was worsening and I had to, you know, was concerned enough to take myself to the ER. As an ER nurse, you know, it takes a lot to feel like you need to go to the ER. Um, I consider myself quite literate, uh, health literate uh, by nature of my background, but in, this, but in this instance, I found myself a bit lost in the conversation because I was anxious. I was worried. I was really worried that I waited too long to get help. And um, basically, I was scared and I was vulnerable. And I was also signing general treatment consents and I was nodding along um, with the plan of care was described. And when I look back in hindsight, I really can see that I probably was missing a lot of what was going on in the moment. So none of us are really immune to that um, situation. Um, at the end of the day, it's best to use simple, clear language to avoid any opportunity for misunderstanding. So there are four basic descriptors of literacy levels. Proficient, someone who's proficient can perform complex and challenging literacy, act, challenging literacy activities. An example of health materials that require proficient skills is a table of information about health insurance costs based on income and family size. Think of your um, uh, open enrollment benefit booklets that you get when it's time for open enrollment. There's generally a lot of tables and they you know, cross-reference a lot of material. So that would be, that would take some proficient literacy skills. Um, intermediate level, uh, this is a person who can perform moderately challenging literacy activities. At a basic level, a person can perform simple everyday literacy activities. And at below basic, you would expect no more than the most um, simple and concrete literacy skills. Most adults with below basic health literacy skills would have difficulty reading a chart or simple instructions. Um, people with below basic literacy skills can really solve just the simple, um, simple numeracy or basic numeracy or simple um, uh, mathematic addition problems. Uh, this is an issue uh, because additional studies have linked limited health literacy to misunderstanding instructions about prescription medication to leading to medication errors, um, affecting poor comprehension of nutrition labels, and mortality. So where does the population fall across these levels? The majority of adults, 53%, have an intermediate health literacy level. An additional 12% of adults fall into that proficient category, proficient health literacy. Among the remaining adults, 22% have basic health literacy and 14% had below basic health literacy. Adults who were 65 age or older had lower average health literacy than adults in the younger age groups. And I wonder, just take a moment to think to yourself if any of that is surprising to you. Did you think that the levels were, more people were intermediate or proficient um, or, or if that's kind of what you expected? Uh, so these are working with the same numbers. And this, this data is coming from the, a 2003 national assessment, the last time a really large national assessment was done of adult literacy. Um, so on a pie chart, um, just to put that in numbers, 93 million, of it, 93 million adults have a basic or below basic health literacy level. That below basic and basic skills comprise nearly 36% combining those two pieces of the pie of the adult population in this country. That's the blue and the purple combined. This population may be underserved in healthcare because they, simply, they may simply not understand what we're telling them uh, when they do receive care. Um, and some of this uh, literacy assessment home-based interviews were conducted with adults over age 16 and um, literacy levels are, are given or people are given scores on a range from zero to 500. Educators generally agree that adults need skills 
at or, above, at or above a score of 275 to work with commonly found materials. Those generally used for everyday, um, those common, commonly found written materials, those that are common, they're generally used for everyday activities. Scores below a 275 indicate that people would have difficult using print materials with accuracy and consistency. Uh, education level and income does not necessarily indicate health literacy. Even highly educated, uh, high-income individuals may not understand healthcare issues or how to maneuver through the system. Uh, we often take for, take for granted uh, as providers that people, you know, are understanding what we're talking about. And as I said before, be very conscious of jargon because even somebody that's very educated in one field may have a very low, or be very literate in general, could be very not, uh, have lack of healthcare literacy. Um, and being able to understand, again, how the body works and the, use, and the jargon, the language that we tend to use. Literacy is a, is a strong indicator of an individual's, um, a stronger indiv indicator of an individual's health status than some of the factors listed here, age, income, employment status, education level, or racial and ethnic group. So what do we know from uh, about a decade of research in this area? We know that low health literacy uh, can lead to lower health knowledge and uh, therefore less healthy behaviors. Underutilization of preventative services, something that when we talk about population health, be really concerning. Poor health outcomes, needless patient suffering, not getting all the care that, they may, that we may want them to have or that they may need. And, um, and as we've seen, greater health costs in the form of readmissions, rehospitalizations, or overutilization of healthcare services. Um, you know, the good thing is that there, there are specific techniques and there's a simple communication techniques. Teach back is one that you probably are already familiar with. We're going to be touching on it a couple of times throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, so there are things you could do. There are things you can intervene and that's just one example. I think George Shaw said it best here. I think we all understand that from a patient safety perspective, how foundation and how necessary effective communication is. The single best, biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has occurred. Now, I just want to talk a little about, in general, about what informed consent is. So the AMA definition says, informed consent is the process of communication between a patient and a, phys and a physician or healthcare provider that results in the patient's authorization or agreement to undergo a specific medical intervention. It's more, I think is there's one thing that we really want to take away that is really more than a signature on a piece of paper. We also know that failure to obtain informed consent may render a U.S. physician liable for negligence or battery and may constitute medical malpractice. That said, it's understood that there's always the emergent case that will be done without informed consent if a patient cannot consent and no family is available. Unfortunately, most informed consent forms are written at a very high grade level, despite the federal mandate for a fifth grade level. Good studies have shown that even simple informed consents at the fifth grade level can still leave many patients with limited comprehension. And if we refer back to the different levels of literacy we're referring to, we have a lot more people than we may have expected in that basic or below basic category. A strong recommendation is to use, again, a teach back approach, um, often recommended, and to have the patient reach, repeat back the risks, benefits, and alternatives of the procedure, as well as describe the procedure in, your own, in, in their own words. You should then document this activity in the chart. It only takes a second or two, adding one more line to the note and can really make a, um, a very positive uh, difference. Know that patients have the right to receive their information orally in a face-to-face -face conversation. Written consents are pretty standard and really you're fulfilling more of a regulatory and a legal cons um, uh, need, um, but the face-to-face -face conversation is what the patient's entitled to. Just remember that uh, some accrediting bodies, such as Joint Commission and NCQA, have guidelines that specify uh, the patient info must be written at it so the patients can understand them. Failure to do so can result in some uh, issues with uh, accrediting or loss of accreditation. The several factors can uh, contribute to a patient's understanding despite a conversation uh, about risks and benefits of a procedure and signing a form. Some of those factors include um, the patient side, in just general low health literacy, language issues such as limited efficiency in, in English and uh, um, English as a second language, cognitive impairments of the patient, confusion about the purpose of the, of the consent process, not understanding maybe that, that they're, what they're consenting to and they're getting their authorization, feeling of intimidation and stress at the time or, or time pressure, feeling rushed. On the provider side, 
some of those um, factors can be lack of time up front for a patient education, so a, kind of a rushed process, overly complex or overly broad written materials, lack of support with interpreters, so lack of available interpreters, or wrong assumptions about the patient's comprehension, not taking a, an opportunity to really assess where the patient stands and their ability to comprehend and then you know, designing the informed consent process focused on that to where they are, meeting them where they are. This should seem pretty common sense, um, but I think worth repeating. If we talk about patient-centered care models, it's necessary, as I just said, again, to meet people where they are and on their level. Um, and in doing that, it's really the ethical thing to do. You know, we're talking about a patient-centered approach. It's a safety and quality uh, care issue. It's also an access and diversity issue so that everybody can really be a participant in their care and, and and have some power in, um, in being able to make decisions based on information they can understand. And quite simply, you know, as we've said, there is, there are some legal, there is legal implications and it's the law. So what does some of the research show us? It would be misguided to equate the patient signing the form as equal to as just, just signing the form to a true informed consent. Some of the patient care research in this area tells us that despite voluntarily signing a form, 18 to 45 percent of patients are unable to recall the major risks of surgery. 44 percent don't know the exact nature of their operation. 60 to 69 percent do not read the informed consent or understand the information in the informed consent forms despite, despite signing them. Many um, have difficulty answering based on questions about the services proced or procedures that they agreed to receive. And these numbers, <clears throat> you know, are a bit shocking, but I'm not all that surprised. And I don't know if any of you have seen this as well. I've seen this with my own parents who, um, you know, that are, I would say, above, above, uh, probably in the intermediate category, I'm just guessing. Um, I had this with, um, when discussing a procedure with a surgeon, in this case it was my father, but we were all in the room discussing the procedure. And I saw all my parents smiling and nodding and seeming to understand and, um, you know, the surgeon took the time, everything that I would think was an appropriate context and the time he took and the way that he, you know, gave them opportunity to ask questions. And, um, you know, they asked a few simple questions, they signed the form, and they, after the fact, turned to me to really make sense of what the surgeon was recommending. So I think this is more pervasive than we may even realize. Here's just a quick few examples, and I'll just, just to kind of make this a little bit more um, uh, real. Um, an example here was a Sp there was a Spanish speaking woman who walked out of the hospital just prior to surgery when it was finally communicated clearly to her that a tubal ligation was a permanent sterilization technique, not a temporary method of birth control. You can see how, um, you know, devastating that might have been if, if maybe that hadn't, hadn't come to light. Another example, this involves a planned anesthesia for a patient. Um, the planned anesthesia for a patient was incompatible with the Coumadin they were on, but the patient did not report the use of the Coumadin until late in the process when a teach-back method was utilized, and this allowed providers to avoid a potentially fatal interaction. And lastly, uh, four months after starting to use the teach-back approach, one hospital department, which frequently saw hundreds of patients, 100 patients per day, dropped the surgical cancellation rate from 8% to 0.8% resulting in savings of $56 per, $56 per minute for the resources that previously had been wasted by canceled or delayed surgeries. So the benefits of doing effective or meaningful informed consent, not merely the signed form, not really signing the form, are pretty expected um, but still profound. Greater patient satisfaction and safety, attainment of higher ethical standards and organizational morale, reduced risks of litigation and related time and costs, increased level of institutional quality. And as we were just said, the teach back method is relatively simple. Uh, sure, it may add some time to the conversation, but in the beginning, but time well spent for the reasons listed above. It becomes less, it takes less time, it becomes more of a habit as the staff become more proficient. When doing uh, the teach back method, what you're looking for is that the patient be able to articulate back in their own words, the diagnosis um, or the health problem for which they need care the name and nature of the treatment procedure, what treatment and procedure will entail, the risks and benefits, that's really important, and alternatives to the treatment procedure, that's probably you know, really important, risk benefits and alternatives offered to them, and the opportunity to consider, and, um, consider information to ask questions. Please keep in mind that they may need time to digest what they've heard, 
and then to formulate some questions. So to go through a lot of information and say, do you have any questions? Okay, we're, you know, none, all right, we're good. Um, which is not really giving them the opportunity to formulate and uh, what questions they may have. This is kind of, re re you know, just kind of like um, repeating again, without adequate consent, uh, without adequate informed consent, you run the risk of seeing inform, uh, I'm sorry, increased risk of malpractice cases, increased risk of patient safety uh, incidents or medical errors. And again, it violates the healthcare provider's ethical ob obligation to communicate clearly in order for patients to make informed consents about their care. And I just wanna share lastly, um, this information comes from a uh, Institute of Medicine report the Health Literacy, Informed Consent and Health Literacy Workshop Written Summary. Um, and I think it was interesting, they did a large literature review and interviewed, um, I'll, I'll, uh, interviewed people across the continuum. And they, you know, identified some trends in the literature that uh, more patient-centered approach, we're gonna see more patients, or we are seeing more patient-centered approaches for informed consent in medical and surgical procedures seeing increasing empowered and active decision-making for patients at the, in clinical trials, but this would also apply for your surgical consents. Increasing use of technology across both domains for informed consent to streamline the process uh, and improve patient understanding. Um, seeing that um, realization traditional consent forms were mainly written for provider legal protection, not really patient-centered approach. Um, and our next speaker in a, just a moment will be talking more about um, patient-centered approaches of, with, with forms. Um, and the literature also suggests a shift to change to more of a focus on patient comprehension and technological advances. So in a nutshell, moving to more meaningful consent and away from just informed consent. Now with that, I would like to transition things over to my co-presenter, Fran, and uh, she's gonna talk a bit more about really working with this and processes at a, an actual facility level in a clinical department. So Fran, I will turn it to you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you and welcome everyone this afternoon on this um, important topic of informed consent. Uh, just a little bit about Lehigh Valley Health Network. We're at campuses. We have uh, more than 22,000 physicians and more than 4,000 nurses. So educating the individuals on this process become onerous and we want to make sure that um, we are all doing it correctly and consistently. So with that said, as Kathy had previously stated, informed consent versus the consent form. Remember that informed consent is a dialogue with the patient and or family regarding the, mater the material risks, benefits, and alternatives of the proposed medical treatment or procedure. Can't state that enough or more importantly, and it's an agreement by the patient and or the family member to undergo that proposed treatment or procedure. Remember that the consent form is a recordation of the patient's agreement, and that document then protects the institution as well as the provider having the necessary signatures accompany that document. The general principles and in Pennsylvania under the MCARE Act, Act 13 of 2002, with respect to informed consent requires the following. It's under section 504. Surgery, any inclusion of administration of anesthesia, radiation, chemotherapy, blood transfusion, surgical devices or appliances, and experimental medications, devices, or approved medications or devices in experimental manual, manner. So that means any IRB, specific IRB, institutional review board, um, controlled studies, things to that effect. And also what's most important, and people ask me this question, I swear, five times a week, can someone else obtain informed consent in Pennsylvania? And we all know that a physician has a non-delegable duty to inform and in instruct that patient on the surgical procedure or the procedures as listed above. So no, so the nurse, um, certified nurse midwife cannot op obtain a surgical consent for a C-section, nor can a nurse practitioner obtain consent for a blood transfusion. And so that comes up all the time. So we just need to be very careful about the physician obtaining the informed consent and having the conversation and documenting that the conversation did take place. 
Otherwise, CMS also provides general requirements for in consent forms. The minimum requirements on the document itself is the name of the hospital, what specific procedure would be completed for the patient, the name of the responsible provider, statement of what that procedure or treatment, the anticipated benefits, any risks and alternative therapies that are explained to the patient and or the patient's representative. Signature by the patient and or the family member or representative, and the date and time the form was signed by that patient or the representative. Well-designed forms contain additional information about the procedure and who will be performing it, as well as other issues that surround those surgical procedures, and I'll explain as I show you some of the examples. So why did we go into this and change um, how we do informed consent? Well, here's the real story. When I was in risk management many years ago, I had a patient who explained to me, it was a young woman, who had what she thought undergone a dilation and curatage, a DNC, simple for bleeding, when in fact she had consented for a hysterectomy that had lent, lent her to be childless and also not being able to bear children any additional. So individuals not having that basic understanding of other things that came up were what was a forceps, what was a vacuum, what was a C-section, because not everyone understood those terms. And I'm sorry, but I'm giving more um, obstetric examples and gynecologic examples because that's what I'm dealing with today. And what was an episiotomy? People just did not understand what they were. So what we did is we developed a consent form to address delivery methods. And as you can see, the forceps are an example of what it is that we will utilize in an op operative vaginal delivery. Those forceps being placed on the newborn, the fetus's head to um, extract the fetus out of the uh, vaginal area, as well as what a vacuum was. People had preconceived notions that a vacuum cleaner was a vacuum, and that was not necessarily true. Um, the methodology is similar, but yet it's a specific uh, piece of equipment used in obstetrics. And in the episiotomy, and a lot of people, I have to tell you, people don't understand that it's a cutting into an area that is sensitive and people to effectuate a delivery, but people just didn't understand it. So by showing them these simple pictures and by going it piece by piece, people have a better understanding of what is taking place. As you can see in the cesarean section, we also show them what a classical C-section incision would be and what a transverse incision would be. And we tell them that if they ever have a classical C-section, that they have to have a repeat C-section because of fear of uterine rupture. So when we go through the maternal risks, we are very specific, giving them examples of why we are doing what we are doing and what those problems are that can occur by having those, as well as fetal risks, newborn risks. And then the other information about blood and blood products, disposal of tissue because people didn't know what we did with placentas, cords, things to that effect, um, so that we made it very clear to them that we would be removing these items and that they would be going for study, further studies, uh, further testing if we needed it. And that if we also had someone who did not speak English, that we provided an interpreter and that we had that interpreter sign off on um, having provided that instruction. With this vaginal C-section delivery consent, we cut down people's lack of understanding, and now we have people who have that better understanding. As it relates to hysterectomies, federal and state law places certain conditions on reimbursement for hysterectomies. They must be medically necessary and valid other than sterilization. So we're not doing just a hysterectomy because someone says, I would like to not have any more babies. That's not allowed. You have to have a reason for why the hysterectomy is being done. So the individual and their representative it must be advised orally and in writing before anything that would render this person in 
permanently incapable of reproducing, and it has to be very clearly spelled out on the consent form, and that the legal guardian does not have the power to consent for a hysterectomy for sterilization purposes, regardless of the payment source, and I'll go a little bit more on into that topic. So as you can see, in the hysterectomy, this is a major procedure consent. I have very carefully um, developed specific indications for these major gynecologic procedures. It also explains to the patient where their anatomy is, what the type of incision would be um, from both a robotic perspective, an open vertical or an open transverse perspective, and or laparoscopic perspective. And also, we have gone into how long this procedure will take, what the recommended um, uh, risks benefits and alternatives would be. Same thing with tissue, um, how we're going to dispose of the tissue, what we're going to do with it, the need for blood and blood products, the consent for HIV testing if someone should become um, injured during a procedure with a needle stick, um, medical um, research studies. We are very, very um, careful in how we prepare, prepare our documents. And we continually review these documents to make changes over the course of time. Sterilizations in Pennsylvania is very unique. Federal and state law establishes guidelines for this. Informed consent is very important. No one who has medically, um, who has medical, medical um, Medicaid or a federally funded medical insurance cannot consent to a sterilization procedure under the age of 21. Nor can any medically incapacitated or person who lacks capacity or is institutionalized um, consent to a uh, sterilization procedure. You need a court order for that. So these required forms, the MA31 needs to be completed. Persons obtaining those consents have orally gone over all of the information they need to be filled out correctly. The person obtaining them that not to be sterilized will not result in withholding of benefits for a federally funded program and have offered them questions regarding their procedures. For individuals have been permitted to witness on his or her own choice when consent is given. They offered, you need to offer an interpreter if they don't have any understanding of what a sterilization procedure is. Um, consent forms are considered correct if they are signed within 30 days, but not more than 180 days. And this requires informed consent for patients who are pregnant and have, are going through a pregnancy and desire sterilization. You just cannot have them sign the consent a day before the procedure. You have to use the 30 days to 180 days, and proper procedures and proper signatures need to be placed in the appropriate um, format. So, so you never would obtain a sterilization procedure, informed consent in labor or during childbirth, or when a patient is seeking an abortion, or when any patient is under the influence of alcohol or substances which affects that individual's capacity. Regardless of reimbursement sort, those patients who lack capacity, who have been appointed a guardian, or who have been determined by the court not to have judge, lack of judgment and lack of um, capacity again, they need to have a court order for sterilization. Be weary of any sterilizations and do not allow it if they are signed by surrogates without the proper legal documents attached. Ensure that you have all the necessary information on a low written literacy level for patient understanding. And again, Kathleen has gone through that. It is a fifth grade level. Sometimes it is extremely difficult to use plain language when trying to provide instruction on a complex surgical procedure. We run into this a lot when we have gynecology, oncology patients who have severe disease with very particular complex surgical cases being scheduled that involve more than just the removal of a uterus, ovaries, and fallopian tubes. It comes into sentinel node biopsies and additional pelvic node biopsies and pelvic node dissection. 
you have to spell that out for the patient so that they have a complete understanding of what needs to be done and what they are consenting to. Because I always say to them, you know, you have these elderly individuals or older individuals who have these complex cancer cases. They really don't understand what you are having them consent to. Do they need a gastrostomy tube? So what is a gastrostomy tube? Do they need long-term intubation? So what is intubation? People do not understand. As Kathy had alluded earlier, even people who have high literacy don't, may, don't necessarily have high health literacy. And we have had this come up over and over again through the course of time that we've seen people just don't understand. You have to explain it very simple. It has to be on their level. That teach back is so vitally important so that the person understands what they are consenting to. And if a family member is consenting, do they have the capacity and do they really understand? I cannot emphasize that enough. In all my years, I have seen people consent to procedures that they have no idea what they are consenting to. And if you look at those complex cases that I previously explained on the gynecology oncology service, when it comes to more than one system or organ system being affected, people need to have pictures drawn, diagrams need to be shown, videos need to be discussed. We show videos of those procedures so that people can ask questions because of the complexity of the nature. Please always verify with the patient and or their family if they're in the room that they have complete understanding of what they are consenting to and have, make sure that you answer all of their questions that they may have or anyone else's family member that they have. In addition, people always have the right to refuse. We've had individuals go up to the very end and refuse to have the surgical procedure because they were afraid, they didn't understand, we could have done a better job. It is a very important thing to do. Um, I'd also like to tell you that when performing and when developing some of these consent forms, don't use words like can't. You, used to ha you need to use the word cannot. Contractions are very difficult for individuals. Speaking in plain language, limit the words or limit to three to five bullet points if you can. Be specific as you possibly can. Um, in external version, if no one knows what that means, it's when we rotate a baby in the breech position to a vertex position in order to effectuate a vaginal delivery, we needed to show pictures of that on that specific consent form so that people understood that if we went in there, as you go in with your hands and you change the position of the baby, you can cause a cord issue for the newborn, you can cause a uterine rupture for the mom that causes, can cause death in the fetus, so we had to be very careful and very specific on how we drew those pictures so that people had a better understanding of what was taking place. Just like an IUD insertion for gynecology in an office, we have to be very specific that pieces of the IUD can sometimes be contained and remain in the patient following attempted removal. They have to understand those elements as well. Whenever you're putting a foreign body into an individual, there can be a piece of retained product. We spell that out in our consents because we've had over the course of time, and I'm sure others have as well, retained fragments. That gets into complications, going over the complications when patients have informed consent, having them have an understanding that when you are instrumenting an individual, and instrumenting, what I mean by, is placing something into the uterus or placing something into the body, that it may increase the risk of the patient's bleeding, it may increase the risk of infection, it may increase the risk of uncontrollable um, injury that is not anticipated, but it may occur, 
if you place those notes in the medical record, you have a better um, understanding that the patient has an understanding of what you have told them and that there's a better understanding from a liability perspective that you could um, address the issues of potential complications and thus, under the MCARE Act, meet the needs. And so with that, I conclude my presentation and now I will send it um, the program over back to Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Fran. That was a very informative presentation that contained valuable information everyone can use in their organization. That concludes our slide presentation portion of our program. Now we would like to begin our question and answer period. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box found on the right-hand side panel of your screen and direct them to all panelists and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, and actually, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question, uh, under, the medic, under the MCARE Act, would experimental medications or devices include off-label use of medications? Kathy or Fran? It's Fran, I will answer that question. So utilizing off-label medications, we do utilize off-label, um, medications and obstetrics, um, Cytotec. And so, yes, we do have informed consent for that particular medication because it is not um, labeled for that use. So, yes, if you're using, that would be under the MCARE Act, some, an example of what you would like um, to utilize as an informed consent document. You should be using that, yes. So people have a better understanding that it's not acceptable under the FDA, but that it's been recommended and it's been utilized um, elsewhere. And so that really does um, help the patient understand it, and it also protects the organization as well. Great, thank you. And we have another question. Uh, it says, I understand that the physician must obtain the surgical consent. However, who should be the witness on the consent form? Does it have to be the physician's signature as the witness to the same physician obtaining informed consent? It's Fran again. Um, no, anyone can witness. All they are doing is witnessing the signature. They are not witnessing the conversation to the informed consent process. That's a very important piece. Um, if they were witnessing the conversation, then it would be someone of equal statute, a physician. But you are just witnessing the signature that the patient has signed. Okay, uh, next question. This has to do with anesthesia consent, I would assume. It says, how should we treat CRNAs in a critical access hospital? Can they provide informed consent? In Pennsylvania, it's a non-delegable duty. It's only physicians. And so they should seek the legal uh, advice from their counsel on how they would go about that. Because I would think even in a critical access hospital, there has to be a physician available an anesthesiologist, either by telephone or by some other method so that they could give informed consent. And then they would have to sign that document. That's a good question. Okay, there's another question for you, Fran. I think most appropriately for you, how often do you use informed consent forms in other languages? We use them in, um, we're developing, we have a Spanish um, consent and we are now looking at our population that we serve to see whether or not we need any of the other languages. Arabic seems to be coming up um, more frequently, but we're not at the percent that you need um, to have it available yet. So we utilize um, like a George method. So we have a program that we can dial into the interpreters where they can see them. Um, and they can ask those questions in front of the individuals who are um, providing the interpretation. Okay, next question is, what do you suggest regarding getting physician buy-in? Physician buy-in for performing informed consent in Pennsylvania? I would, suggest that, I would suggest that they provide them with um, in the AMCARE Act where it says a physician needs to uh, obtain informed consent, as well as the medical staff's bylaws of their hospital. I would think that it addresses in there that it's a physician's duty. That's another um, example that they could utilize. 
as well as the Pennsylvania law on informed consent. Okay, next question. The CRNA in the critical access hospital is working under the surgeon. There's not always an anesthesiologist. Would the surgeon then obtain the informed consent? Is the question I would have is the anesthesiologist available by phone that they could have a three-way conversation with the surgeon as well as the anesthesiologist because unless their hospital in their medical staff bylaws addresses the issue that the surgeon acts as the anesthesiologist, um, I would I would check with their legal counsel on that. Okay, next question: How should the timing of the signatures occur, such as? When the surgeon obtains the consent the morning of surgery, should he then sign, followed by the patient, then the witness to the patient's signature, just looking for some guidelines? I would suggest that informed consent take place in a physician's office, if able, whereby the patient has time to understand, ask the appropriate questions, not the morning of the surgical procedure. The morning of the surgical procedure would only be that if there was an emergency or if there was some other needs or reason why the patient had not been seen prior. But you would not want to have a patient come into a procedure and not have the consent sign ready to go because they may have had questions not answered. Or during that time period from the time they have their informed consent signed in the office till the actual procedure time, they may come up with some other questions that they want to ask the provider. The ideal time is not right prior to, and a witness to the signature could be the person from the office. That's the ideal. Okay, the next question, the reference to telephonic informed consent brought this question. How does a physician secure telephonic informed consent? Well, there's two individuals that need to listen to informed consent. So someone would initiate the call, and another witness from the institution or the hospital would be on the call asking consent, whoever needs to be con the consentor, um, for permission to go through that, what the procedure is, and I'll take an appendicitis. Uh, so they're going to go through an appendectomy and they're calling a, say it's a 18-year-old um, or no, let's say it's a 17-year-old and, and they're away at college and the mother and father are at home and are not en route. So the surgeon makes the call to the parent with another member of the hospital team on the phone to obtain consent for that 17-year-old to undergo that procedure. That's how it takes place. And then both people would sign the, the surgeon and the person who is listening into the conversation would sign their name as to telephone consent by the adult by proper name on the informed consent. You would okay, always want to put proper mm -hmm. Okay. With the use of more physician assistants and nurse practitioners in physician offices, can informed consent be obtained by them in the office? If so, does the PA and nurse practitioner sign the consent and does the physician performing the procedure need to co-sign? It's a non-delegable duty in Pennsylvania. Um, we, we were just faced with this issue as well. Our physicians are responsible to obtain informed consent. Um, they're going to have to seek with their institution. We are, we are having our physicians obtain that informed consent, even the PA or the CRNP, um, since it's a non-delegable duty. Did you think that the Lehigh Valley Health Network informed consents with graphics and pictures in, is particularly new in relation to other health systems and national standards? I can only tell you that I have created these early on. They're, there's a, they're about eight, ten years old. We continue to place pictures on informed consent in the, the world of obstetrics and gynecology because of what I have found with people lacking the basic understanding of some of these technologically advanced procedures. So I would say to you that there are not a lot of consents that have photos on them or pictures. And so it is important to understand your population that you're serving and how it can help them. It has helped our patients in this environment. The next question, if the clinic is a separate legal entity, is it legal to obtain consent in the clinic 
prior to the date of service. Also, do all of these recommendations apply to anesthesia consent, such as doing consent prior to the day of surgery in clinic? There are rules and regulations surrounding how long a consent is good for. You need to check with your medical staff um, bylaws to make sure that you're in, within the confines of those legal requirements. We obtain consent 30 days prior to uh, for surgical procedures. And so that we do obtain consent for procedures, and I'll take delivery. Let's take that for example. We'll, we'll do that at 36, 34 weeks, 36 weeks. And those consents are good for, and they are obtained in our clinic setting for those patients um, that come to the hospital. So check your medical staff bylaws to see what your rules and regulations are surrounding your anesthesia consent, your blood consent, your surgical consent, because um, they can be go, they can go for up to 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. It depends on what your institution has on in their medical staff bylaws. Okay, another question. You are there any internal or external resources supporting your work of translating forms to a fifth grade reading level? As that's a very good question, and yes, there are. There, if you go on to the website AHRQ um, and under health literacy, there is a uh, voluminous amount of information surrounding health literacy, simple words to use. Um, there are programs that um, Division of Education used that bring down the health literacy to a fifth and uh, fifth, sixth grade level. The issue comes that there are sometimes you just can't bring some of this information down as low as you would like it. Um, we utilize, um, I think the system is called FISH, um, something to that effect so that we know exactly um, what our level is when we are done um, creating all of our documents. It's called FLESH, F-L-E-S-C-H, Reading Ease. That's what we use here. And we also use the AHRQ, AHRQ Toolkit for health literacy. But I have to tell you that after a number of years, you get very proficient at looking at words and saying, oh, that's too, that's too high. You know, you would never want to use the word unfortunately. Um, there's too many syllables in that. Um, or you have to look at using very simple, I can, I cannot, I will, I will not, things to that effect. Um, so that you have a better, the patient has a better understanding. So there is a, a voluminous amount of resources on the web. Okay, we have another question. Working in an acute inpatient psychiatric hospital, does that non-eligible apply or can a CRNP complete the informed consent as it only applying to medication and non-surgical procedure? I'm sorry, Jeff, I couldn't hear that question. Yeah, I don't know why the, my computer is talking to me. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Working in an acute inpatient psychiatric hospital, does that non-delegable apply, or can a CRNP complete the informed consent as they're only applying to medications and not a surgical procedure? They would have to check with their medical staff bylaws to make sure that that's covered in there. Because you, you always want to check with what those bylaws say so that you're not in uh, disagreement with what the hospital network or the hospital has put into place. So to answer that question very simply, I can't. You have to check. I would suggest that um, it most probably would be a physician required, um, but you want to check with those medical staff bylaws. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. This concludes our webinar. Thank you and have a good day.